there are a lot of things I think about, like the music, the art style, how much material is available to me. But um, I try to pick uh, what I think are to be the best stories for me to tell. Hi, this is Marissa Duran, voice of Kyoko from Horinia and Sagari from Hell's Paradise. And you're listening to Podcast Across Worlds, Hawaii's number one podcast for anime and manga. Aloha, everybody. I am Lehua Superfina, host of Podcast Across Worlds, where we like to watch a lot of anime, read a lot of manga, and talk about it for hours. Welcome to Podcast Across Worlds. In today's episode, we have the honor to have Sean Gan as our guest today. He is a Filipino American ADR director and voice artist for Crunchyroll. He has been the voice of many characters in a lot of your favorite anime. However, you may know him as the voice of Hikiji Tengai from My Hero Academia and Kazuya Nachi from Fuka. He has also been the assistant ADR director for many titles like Fruit Basket Season 2 and Finale, One Piece, Radiant, and Shadow House. He's also known as an ADR director for many titles like Shadow House Season 2, Buddy Daddies, The Apothecary Diaries, Laid Back Camp, and currently Anime Season Spring 2024, Kaiju Number 8. Welcome to Podcast Across Worlds, Sean. Thank you so much for taking your time to be a guest here. We're so excited to have you here. Like super Thank excited. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. <laughs> now, I want to go over your career and background. So what first sparked your interest in voice acting and directing? Uh, I guess it's a twofold thing for voice acting money <laughs> that was a my first spark <laughs> uh growing up uh overseas i had anime in my life a lot and it wasn't really something that as a viewer i thought was really for me i kind of just looked at it as like oh that's great and uh i really love the shows you know i saw speed racer transformers voltron stuff like that and uh it never really occurred to me since it was usually in a foreign language that that was something that i personally could do uh, I thought mm. maybe, oh, I'd love to do Looney Tunes one day or uh, the kind of Western animation sort of things. But mm -hmm. it wasn't until I uh, moved to the States for college uh, that I met Caitlin Glass and Anthony Bowling. They both were uh, classmates of mine uh, at the University of Texas Arlington. And we watched Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball, Cowboy Bebop uh, every week, waited and waited and waited for those things to come out. You know, we, we don't have the, <laughs> we didn't have the streaming option then. And it just mm -mm. was kind of like a, kind of like, you know, holding on for dear life to see the next one. And uh, if anybody's familiar with Dragon Ball Z, especially not much gets covered in that short sp time span. So you kind of left hanging a lot of the times, but we, mm -hmm. we loved it and we kept up with it. But even then I still thought of it more as um, something for entertainment value, even though there were dub voices over it. I just looked at it as, oh, that's fun, and yo, Funimation is here, but that's not really something that I'll be doing. Uh, Anthony and Caitlin both got involved in the process before I did. Uh, I was more focused on being a theater performer during that time, and even TV and film was not an interest of mine. I uh, had a, a strong love for the theater. I thought that I would you know, go to New York, go to the Guthrie, go to Steppenwolf, go to London, something along those lines. I thought that for sure I'd be touring and performing on a stage for my entire career. And uh, I put a lot of effort and time into that. I still uh, perform on stage constantly. But um, what changed all of that was I got married and mm -hmm. realized, well, I couldn't just be on the road all the time, touring theater, going with troops, trying to trying to make a buck doing it that way. I was beholden to mm. you know a partner and another person, and so I had to reevaluate my relationship to art in general. And so mm. I picked up an agent, uh, started auditioning for more local things, uh, started uh, reconnecting uh, with people like Caitlin, with people like Anthony, Joel McDonald, um, and a bunch of people like that that I had met at Funimation, uh, just so mm. I could get a little work here on the side. Uh, and once I started doing that. I grew a greater appreciation for being more flexible as an artist, uh, stepping through the doors of opportunity, as they say, and um, mm. being a part of something uh, outside of, you know, outside of my blinders and what I thought that I was supposed to be doing. 
uh, I fell in love with it. And so I started pursuing it a lot harder. And mm -hmm. that's why I continued my voice acting career. Even though I started it probably 2006, 2007, I probably didn't mm -hmm. really get serious about it until 2013, 2014. Uh, that led into directing uh, just because both Caitlin and Anthony at that point had also become directors. And mm -hmm. I was very interested in their process and thought it was very neat, all the moving parts. Uh, as a theatrical performer and uh, creator, I had a couple of companies that I had helped build in the DFW community. And a lot of our focus is on accessibility, uh, providing opportunities mm. for uh, BIPOC, queer-centric, accessibility needs performers. And because mm -hmm. of that, Funimation actually took notice of that. Caitlin took notice of that and uh, asked for my partnership in helping cast uh, more diversely uh, for Funimation. And the uh, first project that we had that we did that with was Horimiya. And uh, it's very slice of life, anime, uh, high school. And we wanted to get a, a more diverse you know, palette of voices on there to kind of better represent the high school experience. Uh, mm -hmm. That show was nearly, I would say, 100%, you know, BIPOC, as far as the performance was concerned, most of the production team was BIPOC. And we were very proud of the outcome. Uh, and it was through that process that I started assistant directing and became more interested in the directing aspect of it. Uh, it really Ooh. kind of mirrored a lot of the things that I did in the theater world, as far as like, uh, organizing people, getting the right parts in place, production value, uh, commitment to storytelling. And once mm -hmm. I saw that there was a lot that paralleled one another there, um, I asked to be more involved. I asked to shadow. I asked to direct projects more. Things were put on my plate. And by the time they hired me as a full-time director uh, with Funimation, uh, my first uh, project as a salaried employee kind of represented a lot of my interests. Uh, they gave me Requiem of the Rose King, which is uh, a Shakespeare histories play that's like Richard the Third combined with Henry the Sixth Part Three. It's boy mm -hmm. love. Uh, it's very queer centric. Uh, the lead mm -hmm. character Richard uh, usually has a hunch as like his disability, but instead uh, they ended up going with uh, uh, Richard being intersex. And so mm -hmm. having male and female parts and everyone is very confused about how to interact with Richard. Uh, he's he's mm -hmm. keeping it a secret from everybody that he has, uh, you know, feminine parts. And, you know, it's very, it's very uh, love confused, boy love, a lot of triangles, you know, like uh, uh, love centric things. And um, on top of all that, lots and lots of Shakespeare, which we got to insert a lot of language from Shakespeare, a lot of, uh, of the, uh, like direct from the page Shakespeare to substitute uh, into some of the language. And uh, I think I was like kind of the perfect fit for that. And I've been in love with that part of it ever since I've been directing since that point. And I hope to continue to do it for, you know, uh, make it my career the last, you know, the last part. And just to point out that it took me till I was 40 to find that Avenue in my life. I really um, thought I'd be something else or pursue other things besides that. But now voiceover and directing is really kind of 100% of my life. Uh, I kind of do theater more as a hobby now, but I'm very uh, much more selective about the theater that I do. Mm, because of the time management and where you can allocate it. Right. Wow. So can you go into more details on your ex experience in theater and how it influenced your approach to voice acting and directing. Uh, like sure. you said theater. that there's like, you had to bring in, like for example, Horimiya, you had to select the people and such. How did theater influence that? Um, well, so I run a company, uh, I'm in a board member, a founding board member for Altered Shakespeare. And a lot of the companies in DFW have started being more, um, responsible and open to the idea of uh, open casting, diverse casting, creating accessibility. And that was actually the mission statement for Altered Shakespeare. And not just for uh, BIPOC, queer-centric, accessibility needs sort of uh, focus, but that is one of our uh, main commitments. Mm -hmm. Part of it is providing a platform for people to access Shakespeare that may not have had that even because of economic reasons, even because of where they were raised. 
Uh, it's mm -hmm. to give an opportunity to everybody to learn Shakespeare, to fall in love with Shakespeare, to get a chance to perform it in a safe, controlled environment where everyone's free to express and everyone's free to fail and also be taught and learn and not, you know, feel like that they've made mistake because we don't look at it that way. Right. And um, mm -hmm. because of that, uh, that allowed a lot of people in our community to kind of, you know, come to me and our group. And we basically have a, a large casting list that we work from. And mm -hmm. when Funimation decided that that was what they wanted to uh, do on their end as well, it became mm -hmm. really um, kind of easy for them to reach out in the sense that, oh, we know this person in the community who's doing a lot of what we're attempting to learn how to do. And perhaps they can help us reach out, you know, to people who aren't necessarily on their audition list, aren't in their casting mm -hmm. rosters, uh, give new opportunities to, and uh, chances to people who may not even thought they could audition for Funimation, let alone be mm -hmm. in the show, right? Um, it was also very close to the remote era <laughs> uh, as far as, um, reading, uh, as far as lockdown was concerned, um, the pandemic really created a, a new world as far as remote recording is concerned. And so we have people like Anaris Quinones and, uh, um, sorry, I'm coming off with top, but there's, uh, I think Alejandro Saab might've been in remote at the time. Many people out of LA, Zeno Robinson, Johnny Young Bosch. I mean, really mm. honestly across the U S we had access to everybody now. And, uh, I think even in New York at Young Yi Chang, uh, he just, um, I don't know where, where we got his voice or where he came from, but, uh, he was available to us and, um, Funimation's, you know, reach became unlimited essentially during that period. And one of the benefits of it was being able to not feel hindered or restricted by the, uh, the casting pool that we initially had on hand and the group of people that we've always worked with who we respect and love and want to continue to work with. But just really kind of as a, as an example, taking one show and making it open to the world and uh, uh, having a more diversified kind of like uh, spectrum of people on it. And just to show that, Hey, we're all, we're all here. Those are our voices that we do exist. Um, mm -hmm. and theater, theater really kind of helps with that in the sense that one, my access to Shakespeare is, you know, 400 plus years old and everyone does the work and it really doesn't matter who or what is doing Shakespeare nowadays. There's no right, wrong way to do it. There's no mm -hmm. you know right or wrong color that needs to be in place or right or wrong sex that needs to be in place. Um, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's kind of great Shakespeare, uh, in a colonialist sense, you know, if you come across the first thing you would ever receive is a Bible and maybe Hamlet or a work of Shakespeare. And it's, a, it's interesting to be able to take kind of ownership of that and create an experience, uh, out of that for everybody. And that's, uh, that's how theater kind of influences a lot of the work that I do. Whoa. Now, what are the biggest differences and challenges you encounter? when approaching a project as a voice actor versus an ADR director? Well, one, as a voice actor, all the responsibility for the performance uh, is on me, especially from the audition perspective, right? I'm in this mm -hmm. booth alone with my thoughts, looking at the work, taking my time to analyze, uh, break down the, the sides that are given to me, and then provide, you know, a performance that uh, may or may not, even if I get cast, be the kind of performance that the studio wants. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wholly beholden to myself when it comes to that. And when I show up into the studio, if I do get cast, yes, I want to collaborate and uh, make everybody's life easier as far as the performance is concerned. But ultimately, it's my creative choices for that character that shine through. It's my voice that shines through. And uh, mm -hmm all the responsibility is on me as a performer to give, you know, the, the character life and to be respectful to my creative engagement as a director, mm -hmm. I'm responsible for everybody. Uh, I have an engineer that sits right next to me as we work, we have to, you know, collaborate, get along, understand each other, uh, understand each other's workflow. When I bring an actor into the booth, they're one, you know, one part of, many when you have an anime uh show which is like 
just on the small end, 12 episodes for a season, hundreds of characters most of the time, you know, uh, so they're one part mm-hmm. of a very large puzzle and I have to make them comfortable. I have to make them feel like they're contributing. I have to respect their creative process and how they put together mm-hmm. their characters and all at the same time trying to mold and shape something that one is respectful to my creative vision for the whole show because I have a, a greater understanding and a, a bigger picture that I can access than the actor can. And two, uh, respecting what was provided to us from Japan as well, respecting the performance, mm. respecting the writing, understanding uh, the cultural references. Um, if they're something that needs to be localized, which is less and less these days, it feels like language and how we learn from one another is becoming uh, more of a seamless connection. There's less adjustment that needs to be done. Uh, but understanding mm. that part of it, understanding that translation is done, that um, time coding is done, that adaptation is done, and that everybody uh, for just one show has put in a lot of time and effort. And as a as a director, it kind of falls on me at the end to you know, agree to the final product and agree that what we've mm-hmm. made is something that can go to broadcast or to home video and that I, I've done my best to represent everybody and uh, that's great. I mean, I like it. It makes me feel like I'm living through all the characters and all the parts that happen in a show. And mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I think that's why I've fallen in love with it, especially. Um, I like collaboration. I like being able to build things creatively as a group. Uh, I think that's a, it's, one of, it's one of the things that makes us feel like most alive as a community is when we can all work towards something together. And I think that's what I love about directing. Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) Can you go into more detail on your typical process for preparing for a a voice acting role and directing voice actors for an anime project? Well, as a voice actor, a lot of the times we're not going to have access to the anime, right? Um, Maybe there's some manga available to us. Maybe there's a light novel available to us. And there's so much material out there. Um, I have my training as a classically trained performer to kind of lean on my experience in the industry to kind of lean on. So when I'm auditioning at that part, I'm going based off all those experiences. Sometimes there's some examples provided. Sometimes there's some references provided, uh, vocal types provided that help kind of guide where you're going to go with the performance. Um, Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody actually yesterday, uh, Marissa Duran uh, mentioned this. It's like when you are auditioning for something, that may be the only time you get to be that character ever. So it's your chance to perform it any way you want to. So analyzing the character, breaking it down, making it kind of fit my aesthetic and how I would approach it. Um, those are things that go into me building out my auditions. And when I get to the booth as an actor, I might be seeing the script itself for the very first time ever. Most likely that's the first time I'm ever seeing it because there's probably mm-hmm. no material out for it in a simulcast situation. Maybe uh, Japan has got two episodes ahead of what Crunchyroll's doing. So I'm able mm-hmm. to look at those episodes and kind of get a preview of what my character's doing. If I even know what character I'm playing, because a lot of that can be very guarded. Uh, they may not want us to, you know, their NDAs and stuff like that. They're very protecting of like character work and what actors involved in a project and mm. uh, when it's going to be released. And so sometimes you don't even get that when you show up to the booth. Most, most times you're like, Oh, Sean, are you interested in doing, you know, something for X director in X show? And I'm like, Oh, great. Do I, you know, I know the character or what's going on there. And sometimes they'll say yes. And sometimes they'll be like, well, that'll be told to you when you show up. Right. Uh, if I get that in advance, I do what little work I can before I get there to kind of understand the character and the context of the show. But then mm-hmm. once I'm there, what's, uh, what works in my favor at that point is how good of a cold reader I am, which theater offers that opportunity a lot. Improv offers that opportunity Ooh. a lot. Being able to access archetype characters that I've played before uh, and then apply them to, you know, anime, which in and of itself has a lot of, uh, stock characters and tropes that you can access and think about like, Oh, if I see a guy who's got red hair, oftentimes that guy's got a little anger to him or he's a little fiery (laughs) or something like that, you know, or, you know, you have the comic relief and you know where they're coming from. And obviously you have the sad boys and, you know, 
all sorts of things. And of course the villains are always fun too. Um, but being able to read things fast and uh, build characters in a, in a moment uh, is part of the job. Uh, sometimes you get to read it maybe only once or twice as you're doing it. And then you mm-hmm. have to kind of let go of it. Um, as a director, when I prepare for something, I find all the material. Uh, uh, like an actor, I can grab the manga, the light novel, watch the anime, um, kind of like do that research in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the times within the studio, I'll have access to maybe a few videos ahead of even what is on broadcast. No subtitles Ooh. or anything like that, but I can compare it to like a translation uh, and then make my comparisons there and see what's happening in the story. Uh, sometimes I can reach out to our translation team or maybe even uh, studios and licensors if I have that relationship and be like, oh, so this character seems really interesting, but we have nothing you know, to tell us what's going to happen later on down the road. Do you know if this person becomes a villain? Do you know if this person dies? Like what can happen there? And sometimes it's very uh oh yeah let's let's make it you know let's let's give you as much information as possible and and help you out Mm. and other times it's like well we don't want any information you know sneaking out like well you know every every, everybody's uh, you can't know about that so as a director (laughs) i just try to i try to get as much information as possible so when i'm directing a person i can give them all the context they need because from my perspective all i want is an actor to be able to walk into my booth step up to the microphone Mm and then give us the performance that they want to give us. I don't want them to have to think about anything else other than their character. And so my job for my seat is to provide them all the context and all the clues that they need to engage and to bring to life the character that they're working on. And um, yeah, that's each one has their challenges, uh, but uh, I love both. They're great. <laughs> I was kind of wondering about that because other voice actors I uh, have, we've had the honor of having on podcasts across worlds. We would ask them like, oh, uh, how much direction did you get? And some of them would say, uh, not that much. But from what you're saying, there's a lot. Like, there's a lot of research directors have done to help out the voice actors. May not have directed them, but more like gave them the information. This is what I can do to help you. Is that more accurate well let me say that everything i'm saying is from a a, an eye perspective right Mm -hmm. anything that i'm telling you is the things that i do uh not every director has the same uh mode of operations that i have not every director uh shares the same enthusiasm i have not every director uh, in this industry is a salaried director a lot of directors are just brought on to the project as a contractor right out of some other studio and maybe they're seeing it just a little in advance of you know the actors themselves and they're really there Mm -hmm. just to lay down a voice so sometimes context the art of directing and like uh pulling out the performances you're looking for really isn't a really isn't a part of the process it's more of a hey we're doing this we're laying this down let's get it done right and even within Mm -hmm. our studio directors are given license to engage with the material and with the actors uh however they see fit you know so some are more some are more standoffish and like you know you're here to give me you know uh your talent and your uh performance and therefore i will not get in your way there are some that will you know attack it from the sense that like let's look at every little single bit and whether that's direction or not, or whether they're just, you know, trying to get as many uh, op- options as possible, there's those things. Mm-hmm. And then there's some that are just super loose, just let, you know, kind of let things flow the way they flow. Uh, and, but from my perspective and from the way I operate, uh, and I think most actors that come into my booth that you speak with uh, can tell you, uh, like even Alex, I've had in several things that I try to give as much context as possible. And I will say that that was influenced not only by my theatrical directing and like how I feel about character development and script analysis, it's actually Mm -hmm. kind of my engagement uh, and my introduction into the process too. Because around 2006 and seven, when I first started doing voiceover, my first two directors uh, were Joel McDonald in One Piece. And that was in episode (laughs) four of One Piece. So like (laughs) we go way back. And uh, uh, Caitlin Glass directed me in Oran. So, um, 
Oh. You know, those were my two starts and two very different directors, but two very passionate directors. And I think I kind of uh, molded a lot of my approach based on those two. Uh, for instance, Joel McDonald mm -hmm. will give an exorbitant amount of information about a character, lay out their whole family history, uh, the history of this particular village versus this particular tribe, why the pirates are attacking this one thing. And, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, he gives us five minute this, you know, description. And then you find it, find out that all I'm going to do at the end is, and then you get stabbed and you go, Ugh, and that's it. You know? And I'm like, Joel, Joel, man, I love you. That was a lot. That was a lot for a guy that just gets killed. Uh, but he can't help it. He's very passionate. And that's how he does storytelling. He comes from a strong theatrical background too. Caitlin is, very much the same way. She likes to lay down um, the context of the scene for you, tells you, mm -hmm. you know, what has happened before, after, what your feelings are in the middle of it, lets it inform the performance. And even then, you know, depending on the character and depending on the moment, she will try to shape the tone and attack of your voice and get options just because, you know, you know, you will, more times you get to look and read something and more times you get to speak it out loud the chances are the performance is going to change. It's going to brighten. You're going to find mm. different nuances to it. And since those were my two first directors, uh, it kind of shaped how I thought I was supposed to interact in the booth to begin with. And since mm -hmm. then I've, you know, of course shaped up my own version of that and how I go after scene work and uh, how I engage with actors. And so I think, I think it's fair to say that if you were to ask actors that worked with me, they would have a, a very different description on how I direct versus, you know, any number of other directors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense because no person is the same as someone else. So that makes a lot of di difference. And then it seems like from the director's side, you have time to do a lot of research. And then when the actor gets into the booth, they have the script. All the information that they can get is from the director. How much time do you have to kind of lay the background for them? Well, we book them out uh, based on their lines and their reaction count. So we have a, a line count calculator. And it gives us a calculated suggestion based off a number of factors on uh, how many hours we should book a person, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say my line count calculator says uh, a particular actor needs two hours. In my experience, I can get done sooner than any line count ever tells me to. So, you know, I'll book them hour and a half, you know, say shave 30 minutes off of that. And even then I anticipate mm -hmm. finishing sooner than that hour and a half. So what that kind of like time management does for me is open up portions of my day for research. Um, so I have more time in my day to kind of in engage and figure out and kind of be more informed myself. But also when I'm in the booth, I tend to showcase entire sequences, scenes, uh, pages of work. I, I like to show off exactly what's going on for a good period of time that tells a story from point A to point Z and then maybe moving on to the next story, right? That way, as mm -hmm. the actors going after it, they have from line one on have the whole context of the story and why they're saying the things that they're saying. And depending mm -hmm. on the actor, I'll let them say, you know, multiple cues at once. A lot of actors are very good at cold reading. And I think letting them do multiple cues allows them to brighten up their performance as they're doing it rather than stopping and starting them. Uh, there's different lines of thought on that. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, how you came up in the industry is uh, on whether or not you do that. But that's my mm. process. And I try to I try to let as much get done in one go as I can uh, comfortably, while not, you know, burdening my engineer too much and burdening the actor that's in the booth, you know, because they have to have time to breathe, they have to have time to rest and reengage and stuff like that. Um, but then we massage and shape that on revisits, right? So they say it once, mm -hmm. we go back, touch on the things that we think we need to adjust, let them redo either the whole thing or let them retouch up on, you know, this line here, this line there, sometimes even just a word uh, and just kind of work with, uh, you know, work with what we got because on top of the storytelling, we are also beholden to the flaps. So, you know, on top of that, mm. we have to have a very technical performance rather than just the purely creative one. There is a technique to what we do and there is a process and it is a learned, uh, it's a learned experience. 
So the more you do it, repetition allows you to get more comfortable with it as well. So it really just depends on the actor at that point, like how much have they done it before and uh, how comfortable are they with going on like that? And how much do I have to work on just the technical aspect of something? Uh, and also giving them the opportunity to creatively engage with it. So, you know, there, there are a lot of factors in there and I try to give before we even watch it in Japanese, because we usually preview it in Japanese. I usually tell everything about the story in that moment that led up to it and in there as fast as I can, you know, in a, in a clear way that makes them comfortable with what they're about to see. That way they don't have to really think about like, Ooh, what's about to happen? What's about to happen? I just, they know it's coming, but then they let the rest of the performance on the Japanese side kind of inform them on like tone feel and how they should attack that story. Mm. So how do you find balance staying true to the original Japanese performance while adapting it for an English audience? Well, luckily there's a lot of work on that part done before the actor even shows up before I even show up. So from a translation perspective, we have a team that translates the whole thing, right? So it's a more literal translation. Uh, and then it is provided to a time coding team who like kind of like breaks all down the beats and moments when characters show up, when reactions happen. And then we have an adaptation team that like looks at it, who a lot of the times has a lot of Japanese in their background. It's not necessarily required, but a lot of them do. Uh, and they look at it and they use the flaps, use the storytelling and kind of like create a story uh, that they fits in line with that language without trying to deviate too much or change the intent. Uh, obviously mm -hmm. some lines can be night and day from one another, but so long as it serves the story, then doesn't take away from the intent. I think we're always uh, good on that line. And some studios mm -hmm. are ob obviously a lot more uh, specific about their language and what they want in place. And they will collaborate and make sure that's happening. And once that's done, that comes to me and I get to work with the actor and a lot of the you know legwork's taken care of at that point. We just compare and perform at that point, right? On the fly, I will make adjustments to phrasing. Uh, we'll ad lib a few things here and there. We'll add words, take away words, depending on how fast the performances are happening, like how fast the actor is speaking and whether it's fitting with them, you know, the beginning and ends of the flaps or whether it's filling out the middle portions a little smoothly. Mm -hmm. So there's adjustments that are always being made on the fly. Uh, but you can also on, on top of that, without having to focus too much on uh, the language and stuff, now you can just work on the feeling. You can work, you can trust that the writers had your best interest in mind when they uh, adapted it and put it there for you that you don't have to go in there and be like, what's going on? Like, how can I make this, you know, localized, right. And also respect what they're doing in my heart and my mind, they are already doing that work for me behind the scenes. And then I can just take what's on the page and listen to the say you and honor their performance. I'm not ever really, I'm not the kind of director that's too hung up on how a say you sounds vocally, you know, whether they're high pitch, low pitch, mid, whatever. We try to, you know, stay within those ranges, but like sounding like the say you and, uh, you know, having a one-to-one -one type performance is really not in, not really in my interests or creative thoughts. I just want to get somebody who I know can connect with the character and perform it well. Ooh. Right. And um, I, I respect what the say you did. Oftentimes what we do lines up pretty well, tonally even with what they do uh but other times you know um especially as a as kind of like a trend in anime from the uh say you side you have a lot uh, especially on femme voices you have a lot of higher pitched performances that come through right mm. uh from my end as a as a director my my <laughs> aesthetic liking what my ear likes to hear is usually like a mid high mid mid low tone in feminine voices so i often kind of sink a little lower on the vocal tone than uh, what is provided to us from the seiyu. And I mm. think that naturally sits more in range with a lot of our performers, but also I think, you know, it uh, creates a more grounded kind of like human approach to some of the characters as well. And that's just from my perspective, right? Uh, Japan has their other thoughts in mind, but I don't think that like just having a tonal difference takes anything away from telling the story, telling the story. I remember there is like a time where people kind of nitpick that, oh, that's not the same from the anime in Japanese. That's not the right word. That's not the right phrase. 
And then as time went by, we started learning it's like sometimes a lot of the Western audience won't understand. <laughs> and right. You know, the lines kind of have to change a little. And we do understand that the flaps, the flaps too, like Japanese words, one word could actually mean a sentence to us in the Western side. So、right. we really appreciate what you guys are doing, especially、oh. trying to make it entertaining for us and keep our attention and stay true to the stories that we love. Absolutely. Like, and we love the stories too, right? And that's why we do it the way that we do it. We want to tell a great story. We want something that entertains us. And from our perspective, obviously, we think that it will entertain our viewers as well. I noticed that you were a ADR director for a lot of isekais. Was that by your choice? <laughs> Or, like, did you tell them if you have an isekai, I want it? Like, how did that happen? Well, not 100% by my choice.、Uh, there are probably one or two that are out there that I would have chosen. Every season,、uh, this is just a little peek into our world. Every season, you know, new shows show up. There's a lot of them. And we have 12 directors on our floor. And each one of us does, generally, on average, just two shows a week. Like, not just, that's a lot. We direct、mm -hmm. two shows a week. So all of us, you know, are looking into 24 different shows to dub, right? And amongst us, we all have the ones that we want. You know, I'm sure that My Hero was super popular, Dragon Ball is super popular. Attack on Titan, super popular. Chainsaw Man, super popular. So, you have a lot of people who have a desire to have ownership and stake in those shows and be a part of those shows, but not everybody、mm -hmm. can direct those shows. So, we often will do something where we turn in, oh, these are the three that I would really like to do, or these are the four that I would really like to do for this season. Sometimes, even write our reasoning for such. And if scheduling allows and if timing allows, a lot of the times we get the things that we want. Uh, and then we get something that we didn't choose. You know, usually it's a little balance of like, oh, this is close to, this is probably from your list, but hey, everybody else took something else. So here's this extra one that nobody chose or was like kind of like falling by the, way, by the wayside as far as the selection process is concerned, or maybe even just further down my list. And per season, there's a lot of isekais.、Uh, isekais、yes. have become super popular. And so there's a lot to choose from. And yeah, you know, stuff like, like Mushuka Tensei, Jobless Reincarnation, super popular, right?、Um, mm -hmm. And they're uh, uh, solo leveling, you know, stuff like that. You know, even though solo leveling is more of a shonen, whatever, but like the idea of、mm -hmm. like transformation and、uh, being in another world,、uh, like a vending machine from another world, like it's even usually in the title, right?、Um, right. Those, those things,、uh, there are versions that are very popular and that people have a lot of excitement for. And then there's some that, Have less excitement or are less known.、Um, mm -hmm. I've had a, uh, one, as a contractor, my first、uh, full, full project was How a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom. And、mm. uh, on the surface, I was like, oh, I, don't,、uh, I had never heard of Realist Hero. But as a contractor, I had no choice. That was just given to me, right?、Mm -hmm. uh, I think、um, once I kind of got into the notion of Isekai, I started understanding it a lot more. And,、um, I think it was something that I can, you know, anybody can grab onto now and kind of like play with the concepts. I think、uh, one of the benefits of having me as a director is I can find things to love om about almost anything I do, even if it's something that I didn't pick to do. I can find ways to love it. I can find ways to bring joy out of it. And so, Realist Hero、uh, is one of those that, what was great about that is still kind of in the remote era. So, I could cast it really diversely in the way I wanted to. And it's about.、Ooh. Uh, kind of like mundane things like economics and architecture and agriculture. And that's really the power of the guy who's been isekai'd into this fantasy world, right? His, his power is having common knowledge in a highly you know, advanced society versus being in a, you know, <laughs> a fantasy world like that's more medieval times, you know?、Uh, Beast Tamer is not necessarily an isekai, but it has a lot of the same elements of an isekai. And that was very colorful and popular. Um, cheat skill from another world is an isekai, and that looked、mm -hmm. really beautiful. And it shares a lot of the same power, kind of like build up tropes for, for like, you know, like a boy driven fantasy that like solo leveling has, you know, basically leveling up over and over and over and over and over again.、Um, so there's a, there's a certain concepts in storytelling,、uh, things that kind of like land really strong in isekai 
and resonate with uh, the audience and the idea of, uh, you know, uh, connecting, you know, not, not, not being in, in a world that like accepts you or you're, you're in a world that like kind of kicked you out and finding your footing in another place and having a chance to start over and be better and be stronger and be more knowledgeable and uh, connect with more people and have a stronger friend base, you know, and with a lot of these guys, a, lot, a stronger harem base. So, because a lot of it is, you know, boy <laughs> fantasy, right? It's like, oh, I've now got all these ladies that love me and want to be around me. Uh, so, those are things that obviously, from uh, a masculine perspective, I understand those things uh, and can connect with them. Uh, but uh, that was a long roundabout way of saying, um, I don't necessarily choose isekai uh, as a whole. It's just there's so much isekai that really, um, for me to avoid that would be to avoid a large part of the industry. I have to right. engage with it. And sometimes I have no choice but to engage with it just because I've gotten one you know property that I want and therefore I have to take on another property. And because it's so so many isekai, the chances of me that second property being isekai are pretty high. <laughs> I like how you described isekai because because there's so much, I've heard a lot of comments where people say, I'm tired of isekai. Like it's, it, they a lot of them seem similar. It's like, yeah, they do, but their situations are different and how right. those characters approach them were different. Like I actually liked how the realist hero rebuilt the kingdom because that was really different from all the other isekais that I've read and watched because this person is literally taking concepts things that we've done in our world and applying it to a whole other one and we're actually learning too so it was quite fascinating for me like i i, I didn't know about economics like that and the, <laughs> the stages and such i'm like this was fascinating <laughs> that's the feedback i've gotten from a lot of uh uh, fans of the show was like, oh man, I feel like I was learning like with him. Right? <laughs> and there's times he uh, does stuff for philosophy and like he brings up like Machiavelli, Machiavelli and like all the principles there. And I'm just like, this is pretty uh, uh, high intellect, high end for, you know, an isekai anime, but mm -hmm. they went for it and they made it engaging and entertaining. And I think the actors in particular that I had in the show uh, were great in it. I thought Alejandro Saab as uh, my lead guy was was very good. Uh, <laughs> he, he often lamented to me ab about the language and stuff like that because he's like, "Wow, Shauna, you know, English is my second language. I don't know what any of this means. You know, like these words are crazy. Like, why is this guy speaking like this? Why is he so? Why? <laughs> like, how do you say that? Word? I've never heard of that word in my life. And it's just like the things that would pop up, the concepts that pop up. He's like, "Are you serious? That's what that is." And you know, even the actors as they were doing it were like, wow, <laughs> it's like, it's like being in school. I'm learning. <laughs> How much time did you have to prep for that one? Do, did the uh, company give you materials to research on, or did you have to take your own free time to do that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, so for that one in particular, as a contractor, anytime I work on it, I can bill it. So I have to kind of arrange my time a little differently, right? As a salaried employee, part of my job is to research and be be engaged with that and get the materials. Uh, the producers who manage these shows will buy you manga and buy you light novels, get you the materials you need to help you be more successful in directing and telling mm. the story. So for Realist Hero, they had uh, light novels and like some com uh, compilations of like the manga that I could buy like in volumes uh, that were, you know, because I, I think it was harder to find just each volume individually. I think I bought these big compendiums that like would cover a lot of material at one time. Uh, I would say that before going into the directing process of any show, average, because it can be less and it can be more, uh, you get a week and a half, two weeks lead up time. So you one can build sides for an audition if you want to audition for it. Um, hmm. you can lay out all the research and get all the material you need beforehand before anyone shows up to even record it. So it really just depends. Um, I feel like, yes, you're given the time you need to put some stuff together, uh, especially as a contractor, since I had no other shows to kind of compete with on the salaried side, it's a little bit different because as a season is winding down and the next one is approaching, there might be crossover in our shows. So the amount of time we have to research 
put things together to audition or whatever sometimes can overlap so greatly that like you feel like you're scrambling to kind of like get it all in place. Uh, I feel like I've been very fortunate that I've managed my time really well and I'm able to do all the research I need, uh, apply it, you know, every day and uh, still put out a good product and be ready for the next one that rolls down the way. Uh, so it really just depends. Um, I'll say for, for instance, before I started uh, directing this season, you know, we do a thing called overflow where sometimes other directors have to step in and help you with a show so you could focus on another show, right? So you have to give them all the notes, give them all the concepts. Uh, it helps at that point though, that the actors are have been engaged with the show for most of the season. So they can almost mm. help the, the, the director that's assisting you. They can almost help them uh, direct it just by telling them how their character behaves and what we've been doing prior to them showing up with this person. But yes, sometimes they have to help pick up the slack on your show so you can begin the process on another show. And this is two shows at the same time every you week. have about a week or two to get all the materials together for two shows that is insane sometimes wow. they're staggered like uh for instance um i i started uh recording laid back camp the season the third season uh mm -hmm. versus kaiju number eight there's about a week and a half two week difference on when those things started so you know, I didn't have to have them at the exact same time, but there is a little overlap in there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us like your experiences with the Apothecary Diaries? I want to say that's a very unique story and it just covers so many subjects and there's so many tones to it like a lot yeah. like it can be dramatic it can be comedic it can be serious it could be lighthearted. like what was it like directing for the apothecary diaries one i love the show uh, apothecary diaries uh in my career as a director uh is right up there with my absolute favorite shows i've ever directed i think they're i think it's a beautiful mm -hmm. pro uh, property uh the animation is incredible uh, the source material is incredible. The characters are really relatable um, and yet also taking chances and being mysterious. Um, I wanted to honor Apothecary Diaries by casting it on the top end uh, as kind of uh, Chinese heritage, Chinese centric as I could, as far as the background mm -hmm. of the characters and the actors and sharing kind of like a relationship and an understanding of that culture. So uh like Mao Mao, Emmy Lo, you know, Jean Shi, Keiji Tang, um, uh, Gao Shun being Alex Hom, and uh, Gyo Kyo being Molly Zhang, you know, just uh, kind of like going down the line and finding these kind of, uh, I think, linchpins within uh, the storytelling where if it's held down by somebody who is of Chinese descent or familiar with Chinese culture, that uh, they could help the pronunciation, one, because <laughs> mm. Chinese language, uh, uh, depending on your region, well, all of the regions, but depending on each region, it's just so difficult for us uh, and even for like a, a Japanese perspective because we're so used to doing and pronouncing and matching up things to what Japan has been saying, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't like 100% Chinese because it is written by a Japanese mangaka. Um, yeah. Artists, but a lot of words were used and a lot of uh, cultural references were used. And I think having, you know, uh, a connection to that helped that a lot. Uh, then interspersed in between, including other major characters, you know, casting out the, you know, the best performers we can for it. But just on its base level, I loved it because it's um, one, it's a, a strong femme led uh, performance, Mao Mao being um, ace. Uh, is really great too. Uh, having no like kind of like sexuality to her, uh, mm -hmm. that one way kind of romance between Jean Shi and her, where Jean Shi just is fascinated with her and maybe even in love with her, but she's not concerned with that at all. You know, she has mm -mm. her desires and her things that she wants, and a lot of people are kind of beholden to that and respect her for those things. When she's super smart. She loves to experiment. She loves apothecary and being an apothecary in general. She loves poison taste testing, which is wild and crazy, right? She right? experiments on herself. 
Um, she's very intuitive, very observant. Uh, there's a big Sherlock Holmes element to the way she behaves and acts that I think is really interesting because you can almost on the mm-hmm. on the surface call it Detective Mau Mau, like Detective Conan or something like that. You know, just like a uh, <laughs> she's <laughs> she's always got the answers or at least has the pieces to kind of point people in the right direction. Um, she has like she's very you know she has big outbursts but she's very introverted in the sense that she just wants to keep to herself and do the things that make her happy and uh Mm -hmm. things that she loves and be with who she considers her own family and just the world around her is so colorful and bright i mean ancient china the verdigris house the district of like where the courtesans stay the the rear palace the front palace all the pomp and circumstance of being in ancient China and dealing with nobility and royalty. Uh, it's mm-hmm. just gorgeous. Um, and almost like how in Japan, when they want to you know, display the majesty of their country, it's a lot of Mount Fuji. It's a lot of uh, cherry blossom season. It's a lot of nature. Whereas in mm-hmm. these Chinese, um, like Donghua type uh, properties and least stories that focus on China, it's like the, the, you know, the regalness of the outfits, uh, the color palette of everybody, mm the plants and flowers surrounding everybody, the ornate design of things. Cause if you watch mm-hmm. that, you also see that like on top of the characters being designed so beautifully behind them, there's such intricate detail in the walls and the columns and in the background. Like it's always, there's always so much uh, attention to detail given in that. And you can tell that um, Toho just loves that property and Japan has become rather obsessed with that property too. Like you know, they're on everything. They're on their medical magazines. They're on their uh, railways. Uh, there's pop-up shops constantly. I get so much material for it. Just a, uh, you know, like plushies, toys, swag. It just like everyone's really, uh, especially in Japan, obsessed with that show. And uh, what a great time for it to come out too. Like uh, as far as anime is concerned, because like Freer in was at the same time and to have two really beautiful properties for the, for two very different reasons and two different, very different styles, like basically, you know, competing for the minds and hearts of its fa- uh, of their fan base. You know, I'm just <laughs> like how fortunate we were to have both of those things at the same exact time. Right. I uh, just, they're just so, and, and to have strong, femme led sort of like presences in both of them where they aren't, you know, where they aren't just like uh, prizes to be won or these things that you can sexually like, you know, idolize or something like that. They were, they're all just mm-hmm. very strong on their own feet and like doing what they do and kind of like processing the world around them. I just, uh, I love Apothecary Diaries. I love stories like that. And I think that's what drew me to it. And of course, working with the actors who all had a very strong love for the property too and wanted it to be the best that it could be. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just really great. I really love that property. And then you also did directing for Laid Back Camp, which is, I want to say, very different. It's oh, literally like laid back. You know, you have these high school girls whose hobby is camping and they're going through the process of preparing for the camp they're doing the camping it's educational it's a slice of life what was it like what is it like directing for like that camp uh well one i love it my it's my wife's absolute favorite show she is a huge fan of laid back camp uh she's the kind of person that watches a dub because uh she's a little slow on the the reading side like because she you know has a little processing thing so subtitles aren't really uh her cup of tea uh but Mm -hmm. she loved that show so much she watched it through the subtitles all the way to the end of season two and she's you know watched the movie and stuff so she really is that's how engaged she was with it um jade saxton was the original director for season one of that property and she cast it and she built uh the core uh of performers that is in the, the property and mm-hmm. she uh, has such wonderful talent in there. And uh, Morgan Luray and Celeste Perez, Hannah Leah, Caitlin Barr, Molly Zhang, um, Lindsay Seidel, these, uh, Leah Clark, they're all such strong, strong femme performers. And you can tell that like they really enjoy each other. Like they could, they're all friends in real life, right? They all kind of mm. engage with each other in real life. They all celebrate each other's wins. They all have a love for the work itself. 
Um, Laid Back Camp is one of those shows where you look at it and you're like, oh, this is so beautiful. I can't believe this is what it is. And you realize that a lot of it's based on absolute reality, like absolute marker points and site locations and uh, things that are uh, happening in that area of Japan that they're, you know, that they're experiencing. Uh, the the wistfulness, the camaraderie, um, the feeling of nature just being beautiful and overwhelming. Uh, uh, I'm a Pisces, so anything makes me cry. So I watch Late Back Camp and I cry every time. Like I'm watching it, I'm just like, man, it's so beautiful. <laughs> this is the greatest show ever. And like, it makes me feel good. And when I'm directing it, every person that comes in there is so in love with their characters and in love with the engagement that each of these characters have with one another. You can tell it, you can tell as they're going through it. And um, I'm very, very fortunate that being able to take over something like that, where everyone was so close that they respected me and were, uh, became well engaged with me and wanted to work with me and grew to love working with me and like have, and going through my process and building these characters and these stories together and uh, really kind of enjoying our time together. It's uh, to me, directing mm -hmm. that is not so much directing as being in a room with somebody that I just enjoy their personality. I enjoy uh, the life that they bring to something. And frankly, they're just telling the story to me at that point, because I, there's hardly anything I have to say to them. They know the characters. Um, I know the characters. Uh, we know where they're going. We know there's never anything bad that's gonna happen to these girls because it's just about camping, you know, the, the worst that happens is they make, you know, ill-advised choices about where to camp and aren't prepared and are uncomfortable or, you know, could have gotten mm -hmm. really cold and therefore whatnot, but everyone's always connected to one another, engaging with others. So you never feel like anything bad's going to happen, but the stakes are always very high for them to succeed at what they try to do. And the food right. is so delicious looking. <laughs> the the comfort <laughs> feel of what they do is so like they always look like they're having the absolute best time uh hot springs are more of a thing in japan obviously than they are here mm -hmm. so like i'm always just like wow they go to hot springs all the time they always look so comfortable like how <laughs> how do they get to do that and um uh i also have had the benefit of doing season two kind of coming to a completion on that and finishing it just in time for a simul dub on uh season three and season three has changed over studios so the animation style has changed too it's a little more polished it looks a little closer to the uh the manga as far as the styling but like they have not deviated so far that like it's shocking you know to go from one season to the next and be like oh they look so different no they look very much the same there's just a little bit of a sheen to what they're doing and some of the scenes even look brighter and more alive and uh the the way their mouths work is, as far as flat passing is concerned like mm -hmm. they've kept the personality really really intact and the way you can uh engage with it is very much the same laid back camps one of the uh, since i'm doing it opposite apothecary diaries and i was doing it opposite uh now kaiju number eight uh it's a escape for me because there's so much that goes on in apothecary diaries like there's so much drama and uh so many scary moments and it's so mm -hmm. much mystery and kaiju number eight is so much action and so much extra sensory stuff hitting you that whenever i review like a booth review or get to record or direct somebody or i do a mix review where i'm about to send the broadcast i can i just i do this i can lay back and just watch it <laughs> And I'm just like, oh, this is so good. And I feel relaxed and rejuvenated, just like them, just like them. It's just, it brings me to life. And uh, I think that's where its popularity comes from. I, I say this often to everybody that th talks about the show. It's like, I imagine uh, the people that love the show are like salarymen that like work 60 to 80 hours on average in Japan, you know, and the, the, the only <laughs> time they get to escape to camp or do the things like enjoy nature is to watch that show and just be like, why am I not doing that right now? What am I doing? <laughs> this is my chance, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's just a, it's just a fun comfort show, and everyone's so lovely and kind. And uh, you, you watch, and you're like, man, I want those kind of engagements for myself. You know, that's the, mm -hmm. you, you want those kind of friendships. You want those people's interests. You want to be able to engage with the world around you the way they do, and be as excited about it as they are. Uh, and that's what makes Late That Camp so special. Right. It kind of reminded me that that was that's a, actually a really good recommendation for someone who wants like a wholesome, 
and heartwarming story because I feel like every season there's a story like that. Like Hori Mia was one of those oh, yeah, where it just makes so. you feel good wa after watching it. And then Sign of Affection and Laid Back Camp. That's a good one. My co-host, Mikhail Casanova, he gets tired of shonen isekais and he's like, I just want something that will make me cry. <laughs> and me too. Now it's gonna be that. now it's gonna be laid back camp for him. Yeah, and sign of then, you just kind of under your breath said sign of affection there. We uh my wife and I watched all of that. That was a great series too. Mm hmm Then speaking of my co-host, Mikhail Casanova, his other favorite anime was Buddy Daddies. Uh, now uh -huh. when I found out you directed that, I was like, I need to talk about Buddy Daddies. We have to. How was that? What was it like when you got that title? Like, it's an so, interesting story. <laughs> right? And even from the title alone, it's very interesting. And it's an original, right? So there's no material for it. There's nothing that you can know about the show before you got it. I saw the trailer for mm -hmm. it and I saw the title and I thought to myself, I have to have this show. This is like just on the name alone. I want this show. I don't care. Right? Whether or not it's a spy family ripoff, which was a lot of people knocking it right at the very beginning, or if it's, you know, why why it would be a problem. There there was a lot of people like, oh, it's just gay spy family. I'm like, mm, I doubt that. But I also say, who cares if it is? It would be amazing if it were. Right? Uh, right? But that show turned out so great. Um, the action is so good in it. The family dynamic is so good in it. And the storytelling elements so great. It may it I, my actors that were in that show constantly tell me, God, I wish that the story would go on. I wish they would do another story. Mm -hmm. They that's how much they love mm -hmm. the show. Um, people engage with them at cons about it all the time. Um, so my Ray was uh, David Matranga, uh, Kazia was uh, Landon McDonald, and uh, our little Miri was Emmy Lowe also played Mau Mau for me. Um, and they were such a good trio together. And Austin Tyndall uh, played kind of like their, uh, you know, uh, assassin booking guy that mm. ran the coffee shop in like, you know, like his engagement with them was kind of like a, kind of like almost like a distant uncle sort of situation. But, <laughs> uh, and, and um, it gave me a chance to kind of like dip my toes in a more, uh, contemporary action centric sort of anime uh with you know guns and uh intrigue and a lot of yeah a lot of the there were even like tribute elements in within the first and second episode to things like uh spy family that they kind of like inserted in there because they knew uh, they knew that the slice of life kind of like uh assassin mystery sort of setup had already been in place but the story is so mm -hmm. different um the story is much crisper it's cleaner it has a start and a specific end. There's mm -hmm. uh, less veering off for side quests and adventures because they have 12 episodes to tell an entire arc in and, you know, no extra material afterward if they want to, if they want to tell more. So they weren't prepping themselves to, you know, engage for multiple seasons. It was just this one story that they wanted to tell. And it was about the growth of these two men with this young, you know, young child that they brought on and mm -hmm. uh, balancing that out with the world that they are, have come from and then choosing to disconnect from that world and what that meant and the things they had to do uh, to be to make those things happen. Uh, it's so funny. It's so great. It's so wholesome. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a tearjerker. Like, uh, there's a lot of moments in it that you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Oh my God, I can't believe this person is this way. You know, oh God, <laughs> are they ever going to see Mitty again? You know, stuff like that. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, everybody that was involved with it loves that show. It's just, it, uh, I, I, I've been pretty, pretty blessed in my directing career to this moment to get these really, really interesting, really dynamic stories that I myself fall in love with as we're doing it or even beforehand have like fallen deeply in love with it. And uh, buddy daddies was <laughs> tops also, you know, I put apothecary and buddy daddies right there in the top, you know, three to five of things I've ever worked on. They, it, they're, they're so different yet. So fun. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very lucky. It fell on my lap. So since it was an original work, how, what type of material 
did you get beforehand to prep for the directing? So no material beforehand to direct uh, for prepping to direct, because uh, obviously there's no manga, no comic, no novel or anything like that. But what we did hey. get and what we played with is I could get the translation of an episode or two in advance, so no, I could know what that's hap- what's happening there just on the words, right? Mm-hmm. And the studio, of course, wants us to have uh, um, the best chance possible to tell their story without making missteps. So mm-hmm. we would have up to six, I think sometimes seven episodes in our servers that they've provided to us, but not of all, not all of them were complete. Sometimes it would be non-final video where you just have like the animatics in place, but you can hear wow. the say you going over the performance. So at least we could still get the story and see like the shape of what was about to happen, you know, in future episodes, even if it mm-hmm. wasn't completely done. So we were basically seeing the work being completed as we were doing the work with them. So that was really fun. Wow. Uh, I think that's the first that really that's the first uh, show that I had where that was a necessary thing. Right. Um, uh, Kaiju number eight's one of them right now where I've got non-final type stuff to look at and kind of like gauge what's happening. But Buddy mm-hmm. Daddy's was the first time I ever got something like that that I had to access in order to know what was coming. Because having an original story, obviously, is uh, PA Works, by the way, which they are awesome. I love PA Works type animes. That, and they only do original stuff. Uh, we did Opera Ranman with them. Uh, I think they also did like uh, uh, Fairy Gone. And uh, oh, I can't, they, just, they, they just have like s- such great properties. They, they really love the original storytelling and I, I applaud them for it. And Buddy Daddies is to me everyone uses the word it's peak. It's peak. They're so good. They're so great. <laughs> um uh and everybody that's taken a chance on Buddy Daddies has loved it. So if you haven't seen it, watch it. Uh I, I, I seriously doubt you'll be disappointed. It's so good. Right. So you're able to get like maybe six episodes in to get the idea of the characters because the two male leads both had complex stories, backgrounds. And those six episodes that you had ahead of time just gave you enough to learn about them, right? At at the start, for sure, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's impressive that you're able to keep those characters the same throughout the story. like. Their personalities showed more and more throughout the season, right? As we got to know the characters more, but their core stayed the same. That was pretty amazing that you're still able to do that. Uh, how difficult is to do that, by the way? Like to keep the character the same and not so, change as the story goes. Right. Uh, a lot of that has to do with some really good writing. Uh, one, the story was great. It's fantastic. The the arcs of each one of these characters and how they change yet retained that core of their personality is on the writers right off the bat. But as a director, 90% of my job is casting what I feel is the right performer in the role. And I think that Dave Matranga and Landon McDonald are fantastic actors. And they especially understood the growth and development of the characters that they were portraying and knew that mm-hmm. they didn't need to, uh, drastically alter anything to make those characters shine right uh Mm. i'll just use ray as an example since ray is so stoic right and you think like there's these characters that are super stoic that you're like their 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 line of engagement is kind of like this but if they get angry or if they get sad it's like a little change here or a little change there but when those little changes happen you notice them a lot oh yeah you can't go like this much change you can't go that much change otherwise it feels fake and mm-hmm. um, so, like, even the, the point where in the story he accepts Miri as uh, his daughter, where he's like, I'm going to be Miri's papa, right? And he's, like, helping her mm-hmm. from, like, the police who are like, you're the lost little girl. And he's like, you know, you know, come to me, Miri, you know, like that. And saying, you know, saying it the way David does, where he's super stoic. And then you can just see, kind of hear it in the timbre of his voice and see it in the, the animation, the eyes, where he's like, I'm your papa. And everybody's like, oh, he is. So beautiful, and, just, and he barely changes anything, but it means so much when he does it. Um, and that's that's great performance, and that's great writing, great vocal work. And uh, uh, you know, uh, Emmy's performance leading up, uh, up to that, where she engages with him and embraces him, and how happy happy she is to be accepted by him, 
those things really resonate hard. And then from that point on, it's not like he turned into super dad or anything like that. He's still the guy that likes to play video games and slack off and he's a terrible cook and all those things. But at least from that point on, he's now trying, he's trying to be better for her. He's trying to be a better person for himself, but those things that are better for himself are still minor changes, still a little, like it's, it's a struggle to get him to do those things because a person doesn't just go from, you know, uh, zero to a hundred and everything's great. Right. You know, you, mm-hmm. you have, you have to build and, and learn and relearn to be that person. And I think Landon and, um, David especially understood those aspects of the characters. Landon's character, Kazuya is what we call a golden retriever. He's like very attention driven <laughs> and very happy go lucky and very charming. Um, but he has a very tragic, you know, backstory, you know, is, uh, losing his wife, you know, in, in, in the story and having to deal with the remnants of that family and that relationship and him accepting that it's okay to have had that happen and he can move on with his life. And you realize that that character is the way he is. So flamboyant and gambles and parties and does all the things he does because he has no sense and no direction. And that's what Miri, the, uh, you know, surrogate daughter kind of provides for him. Like he makes, gives him a, a means to be a better person, a means to love another person and have beholden to another person. And the, uh, the change that uh, Kazuya goes through and the change that Ray goes through at the same time for this one person and grow, you know, and they even give you kind of an epilogue of like what their life is like together at the end. Right. And that's so beautiful. Like the way they are together is beautiful. And, uh, I think that's why it's such a great story and why everybody seems to love it so much is because, you know, the family dynamics are so great. Kaiju Nami is really action oriented. Correct me if I'm wrong. And oh, yeah. it's super epic. How excited were you when you got that title? Uh, it was over the moon. I didn't think I'd get it. <laughs> uh, behind the scenes story um in january i asked for another property i uh knew this kaiju was coming but i also knew that a lot of people would want kaiju number eight because there was a lot of hype Mm -hmm. and a lot of uh kind of momentum for it so i asked for something else and i was told in january that whatever i asked for wasn't coming my way they had a plan for it and so i said well okay consider this my official request to have kaiju number eight thinking that's fun i'll just throw that out there at least they know i'm interested i had already read the you know the manga all the way through so i knew the story i knew it was great um and then like in february i knew i had the property they came into my studio and they're like well were you serious is that what you want i'm like yes (laughs) and uh (laughs) so they surprised me very early so it gave me a lot of lead time to prep revisit the story understand what was happening, you know, as far as like our engagement, right? It's going to, it streams on Twitter, you know, my time, it streams at nine in the morning. Uh, but Japan's time, it's like 10 PM at night. It streams worldwide, right? On there. Mm-hmm. And then an hour later, it uh, releases on Crunchyroll for access. So the Twitter stream is very much uh, uh, like television. You watch it in that half hour. And if you don't see it in that half hour, you missed it, right? You know, it's not like, it's not like uh, today's streaming services where you can just kind of like revisit it over and over and over again. They, they treat it like actual television from like the old days, which is really mm-hmm. fun, really cool. It uh, gives access to people who may not have Crunchyroll or even in a region who may not be able to access anime services. Gave them a chance to, on this social media platform, uh, watch a very hyped up property and uh, uh, exciting kind of like... Uh, uh, very dynamic, very uh, bright, and very uh, big sort of property, and it's like Saturday morning cartoons almost, right? Uh, it's like kind of like that old mm-hmm. school way of watching cartoons. Um, Kaiju number eight is a lot. It's it's, it's super action based, but uh, and there are certain tropes within it that even like some of its detractors. Oh, it seems like Attack on Titan, or it seems like One Punch Man, or it seems like this. And I'm like, hey. <laughs> It's shonen. It's it's a uh, uh, it's action. So yes, it's going to share certain elements with other shows. But the one thing that it has that say like an Attack on Titan didn't have is it is hilarious. Like Kaiju Number Eight is so funny. I think like yes. I think in the entirety of Attack on Titan's existence, I maybe laughed twice. 
you know, Attack on Titan was a very serious show. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I love Attack on Titan, but it is serious. Like there is, there is like no room for, <laughs> for levity in that show. Uh, but from point, you know, from the moment uh, Kafka Hibino shows up on screen in uh, Kaiju number eight, one, you have an older MC, he's 32 years old, which, you know, I'm, I'm 43, so I don't think that's old at all. But, <laughs> he, um, you know, in the world of anime, having a lead character be in his 30s is like ancient, right? Um, yeah, uh, they're called him, uncles now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Uh, I, I love how like 30 and 40 year olds are drawn in anime. Sometimes they almost look like they're falling apart. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he's funny. He's a cheeky guy. He's a simple guy. He, he want, you know, he, all he cares about is this friendship that he made that uh, has kind of like drifted away from him just by uh, the circumstances of her, of Mina being so great and skilled and powerful and him like really having no actual talent, you know, to go along with her. Uh, the concept of having Kaiju be a regular part of uh, your world. So all, you know, society still exists the way it does. So therefore they need a cleanup crew. He's part of the monster sweeper cleanup crew and goes up there and cleans up Kaiju guts and stuff like, and that's like part of their daily lives and part of their way of operating mm -hmm. in this world. Um, and his interaction uh, with, uh, you know, everyone around him uh, is, <laughs> it's just so funny. He's so, he's so animated really is the best way to put it. While everybody around him can be like the straight man or very serious, you know, he bounces mm -hmm. off and, and deals with things. Uh, but Reno, his partner, when it's all said and done, ends up being like, his reactions are just as animated and great in context of Kafka. And his, the way his relationships build with uh, all the cadets and all the, uh, you know, officers and stuff like that become really integral to the plot and uh, how they engage with one another. Um, it's it's got an element of reality in the sense that he's just one of the guys and he just wants to be friends and he just wants to do his best and not even his best. And like, I have to be the greatest hero that ever lived, or I have to, you know, go beyond or anything. He just wants to be a better version of himself. And this life that he's fixated on with his best friend is the life that he wants. He wants to be good enough to be with her because mm -hmm their best friends or he loves her or whatever. Um, and she obviously within the storytelling re remembers that too. And is disappointed that he's not there with her yet. Right. And like, she wants him there, but she can't give him favoritism. And, um, you know, he's having to deal with hiding uh, this, you know, transformative thing in him, you know, very much in the same way that Aaron Yeager had to hide being able to transform into a Titan yet didn't hide it for very long. And the same same thing for him, you know, he, he has to deal with how he can't seem to control this transformation that he has. And he doesn't understand why it's happening, you know, other than the thing that went inside him made him transform. He doesn't understand, like, how to control it or what's going on with his body or anything like that. Um, but, like, the stakes are, feel really high. Everything feels super grounded. You can feel the weight of the things that they're doing. The animation is incredible. Uh, the coloration mm -hmm. is incredible. It is bloody. It is so bloody and gross. And they even pixelate <laughs> like poop. They pixelate certain things because you know the, it's just yeah. already so much in the in the show. <laughs> uh, and it, and they play that for comedic effect too. And the fact that they also focus on his uh, monster sweeper team with like these colorful characters that are kind of like these everyman kind of dudes that like are like yeah we love Kafka oh he's so great and. Yeah, mm -hmm. down. let's clean up this, you know, this crap that's over here. And also they support him. They want him to succeed. It's just, it's just a, a really engaging show. And I, uh, I love the music, the music uh, beyond the opening and ending. There's a, a band uh, that's, uh, I forget the singer that's with them, but there is a band that does all the in, in between stuff called the Kaiju band. And they're really cool. They give this very, it's not, 100% similar, but there's like a cowboy bebop feel to how like how cool the music is and how it transitions from mm -hmm. one thing to the next. And then just to give the opening and ending their love, you know, young blood with the opener, such a banger fucking, um, um, what you would call it? Uh, one Republic, uh, with mm -hmm. the ending credit is so great too. And the animation that accompanies both those things fits so well. Oh man, it, it's so, uh, 
like I, said, I cry at everything. And I like when I watch that, I'm like, oh, this is so good. Like I'm just like this is <laughs> just it feels overwhelming to watch it. And everybody has been so positive about it, right? Uh from the talent around us, uh, their friends, our peers, uh, everybody that's seen it has been really supportive and uh very uh enthusiastic about it. I've gotten compliments from people on the Crunchyroll floor that don't even have anything to do with the production aspect of it. They're just like, oh, Sokai, you're so great. You know, I'm glad that we're doing it. I'm glad that it's like, you know, symboled up so the Japanese and the English and all the other languages are all coming out at the same time so everybody can enjoy it at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, even the online engagement, for the most part, like, you know, every, like, I'll look at the comments underneath a, a show just to kind of get, you know, comments don't really drive one thing what I do one way or the other, but I do like to see mm-hmm. the, whether something is uh, striking a chord with their audience. And per episode, you can see just thousands of comments underneath like what's going on and you scroll through it and 99.9% of them is super positive. And then like every 50 or so comments, you'll see one person go mid or you'll see one person go, man, looks like this is Jack on Titan. And like <laughs> to, each, to each their own, but usually uh, you'll see a lot more, abrasive negative comments for a show is like oh i hate that they're dubbing it or you know uh dubs o- you know subs over dubs or you know why even try mm-hmm. you know like like, like really attacking mm-hmm. there's even even the detractors of the show don't really attack it that much they just have you know it either affects them or it doesn't affect them in the way or they mm-hmm. feel like it has this story element or it doesn't have the story element and so to me that's kind of a win like uh to see that like the overwhelming uh feeling for the show is that it's positive and fun and that they love the music and that they love the uh, voice actors that are a part of it. uh, And they feel like their voices are great for it and that they have love across the board. Like they love the Seiyus, they love the English actors and like even the other languages that have been given, you know, like there's like, I think like nine or 10 other languages that release at the same time. And those languages, like all their engagement is really positive too. So I, uh, in general, like um, Kaiju Number Eight has been a really uplifting and positive experience for me, and I'm so grateful to have it because it's certainly the biggest property on its face, you know, that I've ever had, you know. And I thought mm-hmm. Apothecary Diaries was like my big property, you know. And to go from okay. Apothecary Diaries into uh, Kaiju Number Eight is a dream. Uh, I really uh, think that was a uh, a great opportunity. And I hope not to waste it. I hope to engage with the uh, with all our fans, and I hope to mm-hmm. uh, you know keep working on it and telling a great story. And I there's so there's so many surprises uh, available. I think even you know obviously uh, the antagonists haven't shown up yet for the show, uh, but I mm-hmm. feel like just reading the manga, the antagonists are really interesting. They're not your typical type of uh, villains. Um, they're very mysterious as to, you know, where, where they came from, why they're doing the things they're doing, how long they may have been around or not. Um, Mm -hmm. and just like how they interact with the world around them too. They give a lot of credence and a lot of attention to those antagonists as well. So, you know, the balance is there and, uh, even reading as deep into the manga as I have, like you're, you have no idea where it's going or what the, what the end goal is, right? It's, it's, you're still left a lot in suspense as to what's actually happening, uh, mm-hmm. including how, you know, how the kaiju came about, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm glad that the, uh, the companies, uh, I guess, uh, Viz, Toho, and all of them are taking so much uh, production IG, are doing, you know, their best work and putting so much into it. You know, uh, I think even uh, you can get backlash and like uh exhaustion from like over marketing or promoting something but i think even everybody that acknowledges that they've gotten a lot of promotion on this that they're like wow this thing's been hyped up a lot and it lives up to it it's great and i'm so glad that you know it's not a disappointment you know they're like i'm really into it i'm in it for the long haul and um uh, a lot of the music is, is a lot of the stuff that drives it for people too so just every creative element of that property is resonating with people and uh, i'm very i'm very happy for it so you wanted the title in january and you got the news you got it in february it is april now 
how long, how quick did you guys get your cast? Like, it doesn't sound like it, it was long. It, was, it seemed like it was short. Like, you had like weeks to pick out your cast. Uh, so, okay. I uh, no, I knew that I had the show early, but we didn't know, you know, when certain characters were going to show up, what the intention of the studio was going to be. But we did our prep. Uh, we knew who the main characters were. So I created a set of sides and auditions. And we sent that, those out to, you know, uh, all the voice actors that had interest in uh, performing for us and being in that property. Uh, I got, you know, uh, a lot back. Let's just say that. And I went through uh -huh. every single every single audition and put my cast together. And then we had to, you know, of course work out schedules, engage with people, uh, our producers, and kind of like get input on like balance and stuff like that. And so it feels like a very collaborative process in the sense that everyone had, you know, their comments and their uh, opinions and, and, you know, their desires imprinted on the initial part of the process. And, um, you know, we had that part to work out with. And yes, it's April now, but since it's a uh, simul dub, meaning that we release exactly the same time as Japan, We've actually been recording for nearly a month now, over over a month now. So we have, uh, you know, a backlog of episodes ready to go. So what you've seen, you know, for episode one and two, those were done five, six weeks ago, right? And we're, mm. uh, you know, we're recording and keeping ahead of uh, as much as we can. So, you know, as they release, we can put it in place. Or if there's a delay on anything, we at least still have material that we can release and keep up with uh, what Japan is doing um, because, you know, anything can delay anything. You know, people get right. sick, people go on vacation. Um, the animators uh, you know, are working on a super difficult section and they, they can't complete it in the time frame that they thought they could complete it in, um, you know, elements of storytelling and how they ad adapt it, you know, go by the wayside and they have to reanimate certain things. So it just takes a lot to create this kind of like engagement with our our audience right everybody wants to get the sub and the dub as fast as possible right that's kind of like mm -hmm. been the driving factor of subs being so popular one they're the source of origin but two they're usually available way before a dub is available right mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes uh for years sometimes you know we go back and do backlogs and there's been something like laid back camp for instance that didn't have a dub for a long time, like especially for season uh, season two, like season two was out in full uh, for at least a year before we dubbed it, probably even longer. But to have a uh, simulcast, which means we're doing stuff and like Japan's two weeks ahead of us and we're releasing, you know, a dub, but two weeks later, you know, uh, that's when it comes out versus when the sub is to be able to do it one to one it means a lot of cooperation on our part, on the studio's part, on the licensor's part to all engage with each other and have materials ready and available to each other. But even with all that, we're beholden mainly to them to have that material. So we can only go as fast as they're going, right? So mm. it requires a lot of moving parts and it re requires a lot of things to operate and go smoothly that, you know, sometimes life has their, uh, you know, their say on whether or not that happens, right? You know, natural disaster can happen and slow things down. A mm -hmm. uh, fire to a studio. I mean, these are things that have actually happened, you know, and uh, actors, you know, getting sick or passing away or writers passing away or creators passing away. Anything can slow down a property. And uh, to make the commitment to do it one-to-one -one is taking on a lot of risk uh, at, at the... Uh, in the fans eyes, you know, cause we want to, we want to be able to fulfill and deliver what we promise, but life does happen sometimes. Uh, right now, so far, so good. We're uh, way ahead, I think. And I think that even uh, with any delays that might occur, I think that we're, we have enough material that we can keep up with the whole season uh, for Kaiju number eight. So fingers crossed that uh, mm -hmm. it stays that way. And then with Kaiju number eight, there's fighting scenes. What is it like to record and direct that? And how is it for the ADR engineer? <laughs> uh, I do not envy the ADR engineer because uh, already it's tough to watch a performance 
and see a person perform over it. And sometimes they'll stumble and just give you the line correctly. So you have to move and shift things, you know, as you see fit and cut and slice and expand and contract just to make those things fit. Action uh, is so kinetic, right? You have these animations that are going left, right, right, every, just going all over the place, right? And mm -hmm. what makes sense on the screen, you know, they try, uh, they try to adapt it and like put every single punch kick, explosion, pain, anything. They try to put that all in writing for you. So as it's coming, you see that you see where it occurs and they'll even give you a little time code to let you know where it's happening. But writers can't catch everything. And sometimes even Japan, they don't um, give weight to certain actions or whatnot. Or even in, from our perspective, we don't give certain weight to certain actions and whatnot, just based on mm -hmm. like how the actor's performing it or where we think a hit happens. So a lot of the times it's based on the actors uh, being able to react and deal with that and kind of like pick up on the fly what's happening. And then sometimes you have to just slow it down to like act one react at a time sometimes because something can be just so much, right? You want to be able to ah, power up and punch, 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 punch and kick and ah, and make it all happen. But it's hard to do all that in real time and see it. We try to let them do that in real time. We try to let it happen and we try to shape it from that performance as best we can. But even if somebody's really good at that, sometimes we have to go back and like, be like, okay, after this punch, right after you hear that, give me an extra grunt and then like, we'll move on, you know, that sort of thing. And like, you have to, <laughs> you know, uh, insert and like reload certain aspects of it without having to do the whole thing over and over and over again. Cause you want to protect the actor's voice. You don't want them screaming the entire time. And you don't want them to, you know, uh, you know, cough up blood the next day or pass out in your booth. You know, I mean, there's, there's, I know there's like great industry stories of guys going so far out that like, you know, the next day they're bleeding blood out all their pores or they're like, they can't speak for an entire week. We, <laughs> for the most part, want to avoid doing that to a person. We want them to give us the strongest, most intense performance they can and still protect their instrument because they got to go to work in other places and they got to mm -hmm. come back and do it again, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. they're there. They, we can, we can, uh, uh, glorify and, you know, dramatize and, uh, and put on pedestals, some of those types of performances and stuff like that. And I, I do too. Uh, but I do my best even in those situations to try to protect the actor as much as I can. Mm. And we appreciate that because, <laughs> We like those actors we like those voices and we want to keep hearing them and other characters that we love and hold dear to our hearts. <laughs> right. So as a voice actor and director, what advice would you give to aspiring voice actors and ADR directors? Um, on the acting side, love it. If you don't love it, there's really, uh, no point in doing it because this, this industry has a lot of rejection and a lot of disappointment and a lot of waiting and a lot of anxiety uh, because there's so many people vying for the same work, right? As mm -hmm. an actor, you're, um, we don't like to say that we're competing, but in general, we are because, you know, I can be happy for an actor to get a job because their success has nothing to do with my success. I'm happy that that's in, uh, in place. But of course, as an actor, I'm like, well, I don't, <laughs> that, that money is not for me. You know, that's for them. Good for them. I need to find a place to make money and do, you know, feed myself, feed my family or whatever. So, but mm -hmm. on top of that, you also have to love the work. I mean, uh, there's so much, so many things out there that are easier to do than to deal with a world that has kind of like, uh, the rejection, but also the kind of flippancy of it. Like you can give the best performance in the world, but because the sun was clouded that day, it messed with somebody's, you know, sin sinus pressure. And they're like, mm, I don't know. I'm not hearing him the way I think I want to hear him, or he doesn't sound right with this other person. And therefore they choose somebody else for whatever reason, you know, and who knows, it might've been the best thing you've ever done. It might've been the best thing for that show, but we'll never know. And you will, for the most part, never know until you see, that it's been released and it's working without you. Right. So my advice at this point is to love it. Uh, and then on top of that, as far as success is concerned to learn as much about acting and your instrument as possible, work that instrument instrument out as much as possible, be open to opportunities as much as possible. 
we kind of touched base on it a little bit where I had blinders on and I thought it was just theater for me. And that happens in the voiceover industry too, where actors are like, I love anime. I want to be an anime. I'm like, okay, but what if you got, you know, promo material for like a, uh, you know, trailer for a movie? Uh, what if it was video games? What if it was, you know, prelay for uh, Western cinema? What if it's just a commercial? Like, what are you doing besides anime to be a more rounded performer, to uh, give yourself the best opportunity to network, to become a successful voiceover performer rather than an anime voiceover performer? Because really, honestly, it's no one niche of this industry really pays for everything. You have to do all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so love it and also be open to the opportunities that are available to you uh, engage with the industry as a whole and also c get out of your comfort zone sometimes because maybe film and television is the right place for you maybe being on stage is the right right place for you uh you have to and maybe even being behind the scenes is the right place for you which kind of i guess bridges into being a director and i think as a director you have to have a, a an ability to love stories and characters in a way that um, is more forgiving and more empathetic than your audience may be, right? So as, mm. as we talked about before, I don't have 100% choice in some of the things that fall in my lap. So I might get a story that could be problematic uh, thematically, uh, the, the way people are engaging with each other in it, the, the, the language that might be used in it, uh, the personality of the characters in it. I might not like any of those things right off the bat. But in order for me to do three months, four months worth of work on it and to encourage actors to give me their best work on it, I have to find a way to love it. I have to find a way to find aspects where I can identify with who's on that page and who's on that screen. Uh, otherwise, it becomes torture. So as a director, you have to find things about a story that you love and build those stories and collaborate with people to provide the best storytelling possible and the best property possible. Uh, even if you think it's something that you would rather not do, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I said I've been very fortunate in the things that have been thrown my way. I've also had things that I'd not necessarily want to do, but I found ways to love those properties and really kind of put my stamp on them and make them a lot of fun and uh, charming and uh, kind of like in and of itself, you find way, you find a lot of different ways to love the story regardless of whether or not it's telling the thing you want it to tell you maybe it's the personality of the actors maybe it's uh, the way things have been ad-libbed and kind of like put on its head a little bit or maybe it's the tongue-in-cheek way you approach a joke so it doesn't seem as creepy you know or um, <laughs> you know just the just the way you engage with something sometimes and I find that there's creativity and uh uh kind of like world building even within that that's very that's very fun to do and like it's like solving a little puzzle so as a director you just have to be uh open to the idea that not all stories are going to be the one that you want to tell but you have to honor and tell them the best you can anyway and to find mm -hmm. success as a director and find your place here as a director you have to engage with the script you have to engage with translations. You have to understand all the working mechanisms. You have to understand a lot of the technical aspects, like what your engineer does, you know, what Pro Tools is about, like what uh, the equipment you have is about, like what the microphones do for you, like what studios uh, processes are like. And that's uh, a whole different animal as far as the way you network. And it's, it's more like being an expert in a lot of different things, whereas a voice actor is an expert at being a vocal performer you are now an expert on not only a vocal, uh, being a vocal performer, you're an expert on the storytelling itself and mm -hmm. the, the engagement from, you know, top to bottom all the way through broadcast. And uh, you have to know a lot more things and keep a lot more plates spinning in the air, you know, while you're still trying to build this story. So re being well-read, <laughs> being personable, uh, being open to collaboration, those things will help you become a successful director. I feel like a lot of what you said could be applied to any type of vocation, <laughs> occupation, anything you were doing, because there are going to be times where a lot of us are doing a certain project and we're just not feeling it. Sure. But we have to do it. And what you said, saying that find a way to love it and stamp it, make it your own sound, it's, is so inspiring. 
that I think anybody can use that. Yeah, and I think and loving then, something will help you get through most anything, right? Even mm -hmm. in it, even if it, even in its most uh, trying aspects, even if it, even its most boring parts. Um, if you love what you're doing, they say, you know, they say if you love it, it's not work. It's work to love things uh, and to stay engaged yeah. with them, but it also means if you love it that you you can't imagine doing something else, and which is great. Mm. It, it means you found your calling. And it means that, like, no matter how hard it gets, you're willing to you're willing to deal with it. You're willing to try to make the best of it and try to make it a better situation and make it better for the next person that comes up and tries to do it. Amen. Then, since you've been in the anime industry for a long time, oh, you do I say it like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that means it's really good. Like, it means that you've had your hands on many titles like you've worked on a wide range of popular animes like one piece fruit basket the apothecary diaries now can you share some of your most memorable experiences in the industry uh as a director yeah having something like fruits basket and me being an assistant on that is um life-changing it's like such a popular story so many people love the source material. So many people love the legacy performers and that I was fortunate to be an assistant on it and to be in it. Uh, so that was fun. And um, mm -hmm. to be able to learn from Caitlin in that instance was really great. Um, to be able to do things uh, like original works like Opera and uh, Buddy Daddies is amazing. One Piece is, you know, obviously a legendary property. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like a, a rite of passage for any actor to one be in it. If uh, once they come into the the studio, like for Walla, which is like you know the group acting stuff, or mm -hmm. for a director to at least help out with it, you know, um, because at any given moment a director might have to take it over for forever. <laughs> uh, <and> it's, <laughs> it's it's a lot, and uh, uh, you know, I admire uh, Mike McFarland, Joel, uh, sorry, uh, Mike McFarland, Joel McDonald, uh, Anthony Bowling. Um, Emily Fajardo, Michelle Rojas, anybody that's engaged with it for a long period of time or is still remotely, you know, involved with it in some kind of like a, a building capacity. Um, One Piece is just intense. It's a lot. Even per episode, it's a lot because there's so many people in it. Uh, there's so many pirates. There's so many uh, villagers. There's so many, you know, nobles. There's so many villains and the world goes on forever. And we talk about thousand plus episodes now, right? And uh, it's just so much in there. And it's intimidating to look at a property like that and even just as a viewer, catch up with it, right? To take in the whole yeah. story. Like, do I want to make that commitment to that kind of property? And to direct on it is very intimidating, especially right off the bat, because you're like, am I going to do a good job? Help me with this this part of the story that like I've just been like dropped into the middle of. Like, how do I tell this story with honesty and integrity and like still, you know, mm -hmm. keep in line with what's going on? And a lot of the engineers that have worked on that and then the writer that's worked on it have been on been on it for a long time. So you, a lot of those directors get to lean on them and lean on their expertise and their experience with the story to help kind of keep balance on that. So to mm -hmm. uh, engage with that was really uh, awesome. Uh, happy for the experience. Uh, and then to be on my own two feet and to be allowed to uh, manufacture and build shows to my liking and to uh, uh an audience's liking and to work with so many actors and then work on original things like buddy daddies and then to hit something that's uh very popular with the fandom like apothecary diaries and now kaiju number eight um those are all things that have shaped me into who i am and help kind of like guide my hand and uh i'm thankful for all of it it's um it's been a ride uh as an actor like some memorable stuff like uh you know being able to be in one piece so early and to do uh Auron was amazing and then to you know be a part of like so many legendary properties like dragon ball super and um fruits basket and uh to get a lead in radiant which i uh i don't know if anybody is familiar with radiant it's a manfra french uh french manga car, uh, artist and uh it's still going in the manga. We had two huge seasons of it, and then the pandemic happened, and it's like it hasn't been revisited since. But I, I, I really love the diversity and like world building of that one, 
Um, and to still be a performer while being a director and getting opportunities that I've gotten, uh, it's been wonderful. And, uh, you know, hope to keep doing that for, you know, until I, I don't know, until I fall over, probably. I don't, I don't think I ever want to retire from a creative field. So, you know, how, however this industry changes or whatever happens, I hope to creatively be involved with uh, anime, television, film, theater, whatever it takes, whatever I can kind of lean on uh, to support myself. I hope I can stay on that track for the rest of my life. Nice. Well, I really like the work you've been doing. You you direct a lot of anime I like. <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> I try to pick the best ones that resonate with me, whether you know whether or not I know much about them or not. I, I right off the bat, there are a lot of things I think about, like the music, the art style, how much material is available to me. But um, I try to pick uh, what I think are to be the best stories for me to tell. So I've been very lucky that I get to tell those stories. So, like from your perspective. How has the anime industry, particularly in the ADR process, evolved over the years? Just what I've been able to witness. I mean, they used to do this on paper and they used to have VHS tapes. So uh -huh. you know, they would do things in batches where they would like do long passes and have actors there for like weeks at a time to finish out series because there's no such, there wasn't anything like similar. Dub. You were just trying to get a series done as fast as possible to put it out there. Mm -hmm. And for one piece, they were doing like as many in a batch as they can. So they could have it ready to be released, you know, on a home video and keep up with Japan as best they can, even though they were very, very far behind to begin with. Um, and then for uh, certain kind of like audio editing sort of equipment and software to kind of show itself later on. Um, it's uh, wild to see how fast it all comes together now and how fast our engineers are working with that material. Um, these guys, uh, there's a lot of engineers that work in this industry that do anime, ADR kind of dubbing type stuff. But I think in our building, especially the 12 like day engineers that we have working with our directors, those guys are absolutely the fastest, most efficient and like most flexible in the industry. What they do, it, I have not seen at other studios. And I've worked for a lot of studios, like nobody, can cut, chop, edit, put together, anticipate, you know, work with a director and an actor as fast as the guys that we have. And that's that's kind of where our uh, industry has, I think, peaked as far as, uh, as, as far as like being an example for how to do things. Um, the head mm -hmm. of our audio department uses a phrase called uh, move at the speed of creativity. And that's kind of like a, a mantra that all of them use. So that meaning that like, as we're recording something and as certain elements are happening, they're already shaping, you know, how those things fit as we're recording them. Uh, if I want something to be done differently, being ready for an alternate, being able to squeeze, expand, uh, you know, cut whatever piece of uh, audio I want, or if I give direction, them questioning what it is, being able to operate and understand what I'm saying and like, you know, be mm -hmm. attuned to my needs, attuned to the actor's needs and also understanding that their process has a certain way of operating. Uh, that way we can get things as done as fast as possible and work with each other. Uh, a lot of our engineers rotate, you know, with each director so they can understand each director's workflow and process. So as an engineer, they can operate and adapt to any director that they sit with. And, uh, you know, uh, also be more engaged in a kind of like personable way and understanding uh, the different language and ticks of another person and how you work with that person. So um, the evolution of uh, the ADR industry has basically gone from, all right, let's watch this tape. Let's, re you know, record whatever you say, then we'll rewind it, do it again, just in case we need to get more material to try to fit it after the fact, because you don't get to see it as an actor be fixed right then and there, right? You record as many opportunities as you can, and then it's done. Some places you record it once and you're done. Um, now the growth is you basically within that same time frame, uh, in an hour versus in a whole week, you can record so much and get so much done so fast that, you know, you don't have to put that kind of pressure on yourself and have that kind of mystery. You can see it happening in real time. And you can see it corrected and adjusted and uh, perfected in real time, too. Yeah, the 
advancements of technology that makes things easier and more efficient. <laughs> Hallelujah. It helps My us to build goodness. that story so fast so we're not so we're not held in anticipation of how things turned out. We can see it and know that we did it right and know that we're doing a good job right off the bat rather than finding out a week, two weeks later that, oh, we missed this one part or these things don't really match up the way we thought they would. And now we have to delay or whatever. Now we can do it all at once. And it's like, there you go. You know, no, no need to question <laughs> it. There it is. It's right. <laughs> oh, and then is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners about your experiences as a voice actor and the ADAR director and your work in the broader in entertainment industry? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll just give you my personal journey uh, in the shortest way I can say. Um, I appreciate nowadays how grinding is not like uh, glorified, right? That grind life. But coming up in this industry, uh, I started in 1999 in DFW. Uh, as far as I didn't even live in the U.S. until 1999. Um, landing here in Texas, where I'm uh, half Filipino, you know, and nobody in Texas knows that. <laughs> you know, when they meet me, they're like, "Oh, look, it's a Mexican guy," or it's a you know, uh, indigenous guy, you know, uh, and maybe not even said that nicely, you know, uh, and coming up in this industry where it, there were ID ideas about how characters can be portrayed and who could portray them. And me spending a lot of time fighting those prejudices and those, uh, you know, old ways of thinking to insert myself into the entertainment, you know, community and, to do good work, to move from being beyond the cabana boy or the butler or the gardener or whatever into uh, yeah. roles that are more coveted, you know, like being the villain of a story or being the patriarch of a story or being the lead of a story and kind of um, putting my head down and putting in that time and, you know, not lamenting the fact that, uh, that, it was a problem, but by example, kind of just pushing and opening those doors for everybody behind me. And I don't lament or regret doing any of that because it's easier for other people. I am so happy that it is that way. And mm -hmm. my whole my whole purpose has been to kind of like put a ladder down or open the walkway for anyone behind me so they can step into my seat easier than what it was for me to get there. And that um, accessibility and representation and justice has always been my platform. And it's what I hope to continue to do in my work, you know, and I don't think it sacrifices anything as far as the quality or the talent that gets to be here. I think it just shows that there, that, that quality and that talent has always been there in all forms. And uh, I hope that uh, the next Asian person that applies for a job at Crunchyroll, uh, it's not a thing, you know, um, it's a, uh, it, it's just another it's just another day at the office and they get to be there and they have just as much right to the spot as anyone else and they have even better chances at it than anyone before them and same with all the vo vocal performers and in the theatrical performers and everything like that i hope that nobody questions you know uh who should be doing something and you know what color they are what sex they are you know uh what accessibility needs uh, beyond their physicality that they, they might need. I hope those things mm -hmm. are more flavors to telling a great story than they are to, um, you know, being a studio that's a studio or a, or a production company that's trying to fit some numbers and try to, you know, uh, force it on anything. I just think that like, until there's, you know, justice for everybody that we still have to be cognizant and open to helping the next person up and showing that these things can uh, be represented by anybody and sound great and bring joy and, you know, all those things. And I will continue to do that. And I hope uh, that the next person behind me gets to do it much easier. And I, when I mentioned the thing about the grind life, I, I uh, anyone that you, knows me knows that I, put in a lot of work and more work outside of the studio than probably is healthy because <laughs> that's just habitual for myself now i i work 
uh, in the studio 10 to six, I rehearse at night for, you know, theater from six to whenever. And I perform all the time. And uh, I'm kind of like a, like an early riser on top of all that. So like I'm up at five 30 in the morning, making coffee, watching anime, researching, auditioning and doing all sorts of other things. So uh, I just hope nobody has to do that the way I do it. And, uh, and, and uh, I hope that I one day come to the realization that I can like, you know, take it easy a little bit, but right now it's just part of my, my, uh, my being. And so I just, the way I go about it. So I guess. Eh. <laughs> Maybe this might be off topic. When do you have free time and what do you do? When I have free time. Uh, when I have free time is usually around uh, like Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas holidays because I tend not to do uh, Christmas shows or things like that. I take a very intentional break there in the evenings uh, so I can spend more time with my wife and travel and be with family mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, most of the year when I get breaks, you know, a week here, a couple days there, uh, we like to go to movies. Uh, we are anime fans, so our weekends we make coffee and we watch a lot of anime, uh, but we also watch a lot of <laughs> programs on television. I just watched mm -hmm. Ripley, and we're finishing up Shogun this week, and I think those are both Ooh. great shows. And I see, uh, I'm a film lover, so I watch as many uh, films as I can. I try to get out to the theater as much as I can to experience it that way. But if I can't, I'll sit here mm. at home with my wife and we'll watch things. These are things we enjoy. We like we like each other's company a lot, and uh, you know uh, we like to we like to indulge and feed ourselves well. So we'll go out for sushi or whatever and have a good time <laughs> that way. Uh, and if we ever escape from everything and everybody, oftentimes we'll you know go to you know a beach somewhere or she loves Disney. We'll go to Disney World sometimes and just you know spend uh, a week out there. Doing the rides, hanging out, eating all the things, you know, it's great. <laughs> uh, but when, yeah, those time, those, um, we've kind of gotten used to it as far as like how that works out with one another. And we have a great, uh, we, we find ways to balance it out. But sometimes I'm like, man, I haven't seen her in a long time. <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to take a break just so I can hang out. <laughs> and then where can people find you online? Like what social media platform are you more active on? Uh. I'd say uh, for work, I'm active on X Twitter, uh, but I do engage on Instagram and Facebook, uh, a little bit on Blue Sky. You can find me under any of those things uh, using the handle at Ready Kafka or searching for my name. Uh, you, you should be able to find me pretty easy. Uh, my website is seangan.art. So you can also find all my social media links there and like uh, what I'm up to there. And um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think I'm on this. I am on Discord too for, for training uh, for like ADR classes and stuff that I do for speaking engagements. And um, I'm on TikTok just as a voyeur. You know, I like watching a lot of videos and like seeing the videos my mm -hmm. friends create. Uh, but as far as social media is concerned, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are probably the ones I engage with the most. Well, Sean, I really appreciate you taking your time and amazing energy to podcast across worlds. We really appreciate you being here. We love everything you shared with us. Like anything you talked about was just fascinating. And the in-depth that you shared with us was irreplaceable. Like knowing about all the behind the scenes of these titles, these animes just makes it more special. If I'm being truthful here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I, I get excited about sharing, you know, I often dread even teaching. I, I dread speaking in front of people about things. Uh, but then once they start, it kind of just happens, you know, like the engagement is great and I start feeling more comfortable and it just, um, I have a great love for the things that I choose to engage with. And so I can speak to them for a long period of time and uh, kind of vomit up information. So if I ever go too long, people just tell me to stop. <laughs> we're over here and we're like, please don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody who's been listening to this episode, this pod episode of Podcasts Across Worlds, we have had the honor of having Sean Gann, a 
Filipino American ADR director and voiceover artist for Country on podcasts across worlds. Let us know what you thought about this episode and what else you want to know from Sean Gan. Let us know in whatever platform you're listening to and keep watching anime, keep reading manga, and keep listening to podcasts across worlds. Ahuiho. Thank you for listening to Podcasts Across Worlds. This is a passion project that was created by Lehua Superfina and is co-hosted by myself, Mikhail Casanova. If you enjoyed this episode and any of the topics that we talk about or any of the guests and voice actors and various people we have on our show, then make sure you do us a solid by if you're watching it on YouTube, which is on youtube.com slash Lehua Superfina then make sure you like the video, share it around with someone you think would enjoy it, as well as leave a comment on what you think could be improved or what you liked, what you didn't like, and all that in between. If you're listening to the show on any of the major podcasting outlets, such as Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any of the others, then make sure you leave a rating, leave a comment, interact with the polls that we put out, and so much more. If you want to support the show, we do have Patreon, as well as many other methods for supporting. And with that being said, we're signing out. We hope you enjoyed this, and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Keep listening, keep watching, and keep enjoying podcasts across worlds. We'll see you around.